This is the Balanced Growth Show with Dr. Travis Perry, helping successful business professionals like you achieve balance in their lives. Welcome to another episode of the Balanced Growth Show. I'm your host, Dr. Travis Perry. Today, we have a special guest, Mr. Sean Rhodes. Sean is the Chief Sales Sergeant of Bulletproof Selling, an international keynote speaker, author of four books, and a nationally syndicated business columnist. Before dedicating his career to making salespeople bulletproof, he was a Marine Corps war correspondent, tasked with accompanying troops into combat to witness how they became bulletproof on the battlefield. His work and insights have appeared in Time Magazine, The Wall Street Journal, CNN, NBC, Forbes, Inc., and hundreds of other media outlets, including now the Balanced Growth Show. Welcome, Sean, to the show. The uh, feather in my cap, the jewel in my crown is indeed the balanced growth show. I mean, now you've arrived. This is it. (laughs) You can now tell your wife and daughter that this is it. Like I'm able to sleep at night. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, I I appreciate you taking time. It's full disclosure. Sean and I uh, met at a heroic public speaking training that um, I had Michael Port on. Uh, If you've seen a few episodes back, Michael Port from Heroic Public Speaking. But Sean and I have just been, uh, created a great friendship around our topics. And it's just, I've been on his show. He's he's now uh, um, here on ours and to talk to us about bulletproof selling. But first, how did you get here, man? How did you go from being Marine Corps guy to starting a company doing bulletproof selling? Well, in the job I had in the Marine Corps, it was a little different than a lot of military jobs where you're part of an integrated unit. You're around the same dozen people or the same 30 people for months or years at a time. Uh, I had one of those weird gigs where I could bounce into and out of any unit almost at will because there was maybe one of me for every, you know, 20 or 30,000 Marines. And so if I needed to get onto a convoy, I would just volunteer myself onto it so we could get into Fallujah, we could get into Baghdad or wherever we were going that day so that I could report on what was happening. So my path as an entrepreneur mirrored that because as you know, and a lot of your listeners know, being an entrepreneur is kind of a lonely life. I mean, you're out there on your own, making decisions, controlling your own schedule and your own time. And that's a necessary thing. But that also comes at a cost, which I know a lot of your guests have talked with you about. And so it wasn't a huge jump for me to go from the military to being a business owner, but I had a lot to learn. Uh, Although the military gave me a lot of great skill sets and focus and discipline and dedication and integrity, the things it didn't teach me about were sales and marketing, running a business. So I had to learn that the hard way. And through my time in figuring it out, I realized that my passion was really with those people still on the front lines. And so for business, of course, that's salespeople. Whether we're wearing a lot of hats, we're solo business operators, or whether we're part of a larger team, uh, sales is the front line of business. And so I love being in that area, in that arena, being on sales calls and having to uh, figure it out as I go to think on my feet. So that's something that was a passion of mine. And over the last decade now, I've been able to do that for a lot of different teams and still bring that military mindset. I mean, I retain the whole bulletproof piece of what I do because I believe that what the military taught us, a lot of it does indeed apply. Uh, And it's not just to sell more, which I know is something that you're aligned with a lot, Travis, but it's actually to serve more. So my business has taken a turn in the last couple of years towards more of that service-oriented mindset. Um, And that's coming with a whole other host of challenges that we can talk about too. So uh, that's a little bit of my story, but happy to dig into any part of it you want me to uh, go into further for your listeners. No, I love this. It's so good to kind of hear a little bit about the why and yeah. uh, some some of the you know the current like what you're trying to do in the service oriented. And, and I know from you know knowing Sean personally, he's very much a service oriented person. He's always out there trying to you know help others to improve their game. In fact, just before the show, we were talking about how we can improve our speeches, and uh, and he gave me some great feedback. So I, I always appreciate that about Sean. Let's talk about. You know, you mentioned, you know, it's not just about the sales, it's not just about more sales and more money, um, but that, you know, you're, you're married, you have a family. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's talk about why is it important that as you're growing this business, that you have great balance? Well, I realized that without balance, uh, no amount of external success is going to make a bit of difference. And so from a faith-based perspective, I had to really look at, okay, well, why am I here? 
on this planet because I, and this is weird. I mean, I kind of walked into it backwards as far as my business goes. A lot of people start off by asking the big questions and then they create a business that's focused in that area. So they know they're on purpose. I went the opposite way. I was like, how can I make this as successful as possible, get the biggest name clients possible so that then I can be a success. And I checked a lot of those boxes and then realized, well, shoot, that success is really fleeting. It's just not permanent. Uh, there's always the next plateau that I have to reach. There's always that speaker that's doing better than me that I, you know, I'd like to emulate their life. And then I realized, no, they had to sacrifice a lot to get to that level of success. Things that I'm not willing to sacrifice, my marriage, my relationships with my friends, uh, my involvement in my own community. It's possible to give all of that up. Um, and I think there's actually a, a, a biblical quote that goes somewhere along the lines of, uh, you know, you, you, you gained success, but it cost you everything in the process. And that's a situation I didn't want to find myself in. So after I checked a lot of the boxes, now I had, you know, this has been the last year or two to take the time, like hard break, hard press stop to then ask myself if I'm going to continue doing this and assuming all of the risk, what am I actually gaining in return? What's the payoff? What's the benefit here to running a business and having all the risk? And what am I in this for? And I realized it wasn't for the checks. It wasn't for the money. It wasn't for the fame. It wasn't to be on stage and hear the applause at the end of his speech. It was so that I really could know in the limited amount of time I have in my day to run my business, because I still want to be with my family and I still want to be a member of my community. So this couple of hours I have to really be focused on my business. What does success look like there? If it's not this fleeting thing like cashing a big check. And I realized for me, it was being of service whether that came with money or not. And then I had to ask, all right, well, what does being of service look like and who do I want to be of service to? And over the last maybe year or two, that's completely recentered the way that I approach my business, the way I spend my time, uh, the things that I focus on. You know, when I set up my ideal calendar, as you recommend entrepreneurs do, uh, it was to make sure that that calendar was really pointed in the right direction. Because I could be making sales calls, but it's a bigger difference if I'm making sales calls to people who I know I can actually help. And whether they accept my services or not, if I can make an impact on their day that day on that call, that's a win for me. So I had to really look at how do I how do I reown my wins? So it's all within my control rather than, well, if they don't give me a check, then I'm a failure because I didn't make a sale. Well, that's a really crappy way to run a business and to run a life. So <laughs> that's where balance is really tied in for me in the last couple <laughs> of years. I love it. I'm glad that you mentioned, uh, and I had to look this up real quick so I'm not, you know, I studied the Bible doesn't mean I have every passage memorized, but I was like, wait a minute, I think it's called what shall it profit a man? And I looked it up and it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, Mark 8, 36, for what right. shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Yep. You know, something about that, I mean, you know, whether you read the Bible, believe in the Bible or not, um, most of my clients are are faith-based individuals and they they do have a belief in God. Um, what's interesting about that passage is it for what shall it profit a man? I think it's kind of a two edged sword there. <laughs> like you need profit in the business. You need to move forward. You need to have, you know, success so you can provide. But if you gain the whole world and lose your own soul in the process, that is the opposite. And that's, I think where a lot of these people, as you mentioned, um, have sacrificed, uh, some of the richest people in the world don't have a great family relationship are lonely um, are divorced because they have sacrificed literally everything and everyone, mm -hmm. um, every waking moment to the business only. And I think that is the kind of success that a lot of people think that they want because they don't see behind the scenes. They just see, oh, I see Steve Jobs, I see Apple, I and I see Amazon CEO. I I see all these people who are who um, are the, some of the richest people. I want to be like them. Yet, as you mentioned, what's going on behind the scenes? What, what do they really have to give up? Um, which leads us to this next thought of ideal calendar. Now, you have read the book, Achieving Balance, which sure. hats off and you started to implement. I know because Sean's shown me his ideal calendar. He's like, hey, man, look at this. Like, I'm actually doing it. You're actually taking the advice and running with it, um, which is more than... <laughs> Most people who grab the book, right? They don't read it or they like, oh, yeah, I'll get to that someday. Yeah. But you actually implement it, mm -hmm. which is awesome because I talk about this all the time. Like, you've got to take action or else you're not going to achieve the goals. You're just going to be thinking about them a lot. 
What has changed as you started implementing this ideal calendar for you? You talked about control. Mm-hmm. Uh, what else? What else has changed in your life as you're starting to implement that? So the amount of time that I have dedicated to certain things shifted. Uh, before I thought to myself, well, you know, I'm running a business, I'm in sales. So from, you know, nine or 10 a.m. to four or 5 p.m., I'm open to, to you know, whoever wants to do business with me. Like, you know, uh, those are, those are uh, office hours. So give me a call or, or by all means, I'll call you. And my job between those, you know, six or eight hours, whatever it is, is to be making calls, to be out there, you know, uh, you know uh, feet on the pavement, right? Well, when I began operating that ideal calendar, I realized that if I'm going to make time for everything that is important to me, I have to be a lot more mindful about the time that I want to dedicate to outreach, to developing new business. And if I'm really going to control my calendar, that means that I need to just set up like business development is only going to happen in this window in the morning, in this window in the afternoon. And it doesn't mean that I ignore calls that come in otherwise. But for, for my really intentional business development time, which I think is a, as a business owner, we have to make that time, it's only going to happen in these windows. And that was really scary for me because now I'm taking what could potentially be a six-hour block of time where I could be developing new business and I'm putting it into a two-hour block of time. But that means I have to be more focused. I have to be more efficient. I have to use that time better. So it's not like make a couple calls and then go dork around with this other administrative stuff. It's like, no. During that time, here's all that you are doing. <laughs> and it doesn't just apply to outbound calls, right? It could be uh, processing. During processing time, all I'm doing is processing and getting ready for the day. It's not this and, and these other nine things that I'm trying to cram into the hour by multitasking. It's just that one focused thing. So I think being more focused and intentional has been one of the results of implementing the ideal calendar. And then there's also a big fear factor there because I'm still getting over the fact that now I'm limiting the gross amount of time that I'm doing outbound dials, let's say, or business development. But now I have to accept the fact that, and I think you and I had talked about this, that the outcome of that is you're going to be doing more business with fewer people. And that's something that I'm very excited about, you know, hyper-targeting on who I want to be of service to and making sure that they're the folks that I'm in touch with first and everybody else gets whatever time is left over. Dude, yeah. Prioritization, right, of your time. Sounds like that's one of the biggest shifts that you've had. And then protecting for those people who you know need it the most. Uh, this morning on this live show that we did, um, a, a guest asked, well, how how can I give more of my time to the people who need it the most? And I said, well, you, you kind of need to have a value ladder of services and the ones that you know you were able to serve the most, uh, they probably gonna you're gonna have to charge the most, right? That, that's the one-on-one really important you know clients. But you may want to have a group offering where people can come in and still get some additional help, but they're not always you know getting one-on-one time with you. They may be able to ask a question and get some feedback from you in a group setting, but everybody else is going to benefit from that. So it, it, it's a great tool. And, you know, I I think early on in my career, I was kind of stuck with, I've got to help everybody one-on-one, no matter what they've paid me. And I've got to be the best servant to everyone. It's just, it's just not possible, Sean. So I, I I really appreciate you bringing this up because it has increased my sales as I became more balanced and more productive. So I love that. So speaking of which, Mm -hmm. as an entrepreneur, as you know, the, the chief sales sergeant of Bulletproof Selling. How have you scaled your business? You're very successful. You've been able to be on, you know, Forbes and Inc. and NBC and all these incredible places. You've written four books. You're a speaker. What have you done that has really been moving the business forward while trying to keep that balance, you know, intact? So I found the most successful people in my industry. Um, and there's a conference that you can go to and you can actually pinpoint these folks because they wear special badges. They've earned a million dollars or more in revenue. And for a while I was, you know, going like offering my hand to shake it and I would shake their hands and I wouldn't let them go until I learned something valuable from them, something tactical that I could use. And these were kind of awkward conversations at first because they were like, this dude's not letting my hand go. And, you know, because I, I, I don't want the surface level answer. <laughs> You're successful. You, you've achieved, you know, this external measure of success. I want to know how or what could I be doing to model that? And the best answer is I realized kept repeating themselves. They say, Sean, we only do three things in our business. 
and we outsource or systemize everything else. The only three things that we do, we create content, we deliver that content, and we close deals. That's it. And it got to the point where some of these folks were so hyper-focused on those three things during their ideal calendar time uh, that they outsourced everything else. Laundry folding. Like, why would I spend 45 minutes a week doing that if I could make 15 grand in that same 45 minutes? That's an easy ROI to outsource. Uh, and so I began asking those questions and I realized for myself, if I'm going to spend more time in that, that passion and uh, uh, proficiency zone that like Michael Hyatt advocates, you know, what are your highest and best uh, tasks that only you can do that provide the most value to your clients? Well, that means this other stuff still needs to get done, but how does it get done if I don't have the time to do it? Because I want to spend more time in, in my sweet spot. And it was through creating systems. And so a lot of what I teach salespeople now is how to systemize what works really, really well on their teams so that they don't have to try to remember it when it's, you know, bottom of the ninth inning and they've got all bases loaded. And this could be the hit that really, you know, uh, takes it home for them. I don't want them to have to hope that that works out. And so what I do for them in sales is help them develop those systems. As a business owner, I look at everything that I do over the course of my business, all the administrative, finance, marketing, writing, content generation. And I ask, am I the only one that can uniquely do this? And if that's not the case, then how can I outsource it? How can I build something that uh, an, an assistant or a team member can do for me? Even if it's only ever done at 80% of my effectiveness, if I'm not the one doing it and it's still a pass, that's good enough. <laughs> so I get it off my plate. And that's how I free my time up so that I can do more things like we're doing today, which no assistant could do. I have to be uh, you know, on this platform with you doing this. If I could get an assistant to do it, I probably would have sent him here, but <laughs> I like talking to you. So <laughs> that was good. I'm, I'm glad that you're here live, yeah. somewhat live, virtual somewhat live. live with me. Yeah. Uh, but you're exactly right. Like The closer you can get to only I can do these specific activities, the closer that you're going to get to what it is you actually love doing as well. And it's not just the productivity part. I, actually, in my exercise, finding your sweet spot, it would be easy to say, okay, tell me what this value is per hour first. And just mm -hmm. let's just organize it so it's that way. Like, oh, let's just organize top to bottom. But rarely is that 100% the way that people um, come back to me when they do the prioritization exercise. Sometimes it's like, oh, this is like $500 activity or this is a $200 activity. Um, and then maybe the next one is $450 because they do care about what it is they're doing. And the matrix is that you, it's just really just a feeling of like, I, I enjoy this. And if you enjoy it, you're much more likely to actually get it done. When people yeah. ask me, what do you do for exercise? I'm like, you know, I do this and the other, but you know, if, if you hate it, you're not going to go exercise. I love mountain biking. I'm looking for every opportunity I can go every single day to get on my bike and get some dirt on my tires and then blast back down a hill because I get a kick out of it and it raises my heart rate up to 170 plus. I need that every day. Mm -hmm. But if I was, if you were to say, Travis, you need to run every day. I honestly, how you feel about running Travis. Yes. I, you and I went running yeah. and I will tell you, Sean, <laughs> I did a 5k yesterday. I, I did nice. run a 5k, uh, but you know, I was a soccer player. I would run, I would walk, I would jog, I'd sprint, you know? Um, but you know, it's, it's a different mental game, but for me, get me on a bike. That's exercise. So I think the same holds true. This principle holds true for work. If you hate doing it, you will, honestly put it off subconsciously like oh, i'll do that later i'll but if you love doing it and you can do those most important things first and then delegate everything else you're going to be much more productive anyway so. i think the, the 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 courage that i know i've had to begin building it's a small muscle now it's getting bigger every day the courage is to organize my ideal schedule so that i do those things that i love the most first yeah is before yes. I would almost save them as like a treat for myself at the end of the day, if there was enough time to get mm. those things done, or I would only do them during scheduled client meetings. Cause a lot of those things are client facing. Uh, but I ask myself now, if I'm going to prioritize the best and highest use of my time in this business and focus as much as I can, why wouldn't I front load everything that I love doing first and push that as far as I can into my day? Love it. Because if the marketing stuff doesn't get done or the sales stuff doesn't get done, but I'm really practicing, you know, what you're preaching, which is the highest and best use of your skill set, 
through your business day, that has to come first. Why mm-hmm. wouldn't I leverage myself as much as I can across my high value areas? So that's, that's been cur- a lot of courage building for me because mm-hmm. before it's, you know, I got 80 things that have to get done today, but only four of them are really in my sweet spot. Why wouldn't I put those four things first? That's that's the the muscle I'm having to build. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah, and it, and over time, you take that military mindset, and that that will just be a habit. Like mm-hmm. doing this over 17 years now, like it's just that's what I do. And there's no once you delineate from it, you feel it, and you start to feel stressed, and you're like, oh crap, why am I doing this? This should be, you know, delegated to this person or this team member, or or, or maybe you need to hire someone. <laughs> yep. Like, okay, now it's time to hire that virtual assistant, or it's time to hire that VP that needs to take over this part of the business completely. Uh, just depending on what level you're at. So, thank you. I, I really appreciate that, Sean, because I think you're, you know, you're a guy that's teaching sales and front line, um, and it may not that might not be the front line for some people in their right. business. It, it may be that there's other things more important, and that gets delegated, or that it's part of a priority that's maybe a little bit further down. So, I appreciate that. Yeah. As oh, you're this, talking, about, oh, go ahead. I, I, I was actually going to ask you a question. Now we're going to yeah. we're going to throw yeah, it back to you for it because I've yeah. got your time now. I'm going to ask the question. <laughs> so the the idea is I'm doing more of what I love. Yeah, and out of doing that, that's the best marketing that I can possibly do, because whatever I'm uniquely skilled at doing, if I do more of that. My clients are going to take notice. The people around me are going to take notice, and it's going to generate more of that business. But I'm curious to get your insight because I know a lot of people are are at the beginning stages, like I am, of implementing yeah. their ideal calendar. How do you overcome that that fear that sets in, where it's you know if, if I'm only doing you know these high value things and not the 80 other things that I'm used to doing, isn't business going to drop off? Right. And, If it is, how do I deal with that weird kind of in-between time where I'm testing this new way of living out where I'm happier, but I do see a a short-term drop in revenue before the benefits of living this way really kick up? How would you guide an entrepreneur through that? Great question. So what I'm hearing you say is like, hey, I've started to do this and I've, I've put forth some courage, but I'm having a limiting block. I have a belief system that says, I'm still worried In the last chapter of the book, Achieving Balance, I actually talk about fear Mm. and I dive into it a little bit and I leave you kind of hanging. I give some ideas like this is how you can get past it. Um, But but really, there are three main things you can reframe whenever you feel that limiting block, reframe it quickly and say, Mm. no, I'm doing the most important things on my schedule, whatever that is, like just reprogram the brain. Um, You can also have a new and effective outlook that you say, which is like an, aff- an affirmation uh, yeah. that they can help you uh, saying like, no, I'm, I am spending time working on my speech so that I can land higher speeches, right? Those things. Um, so I, I would, I would start with the mindset yeah. and I'd also understand where is that fear coming from next? So deeper work on this would be like, that's probably a fear of failure. Like you said, if I shift my time, am I missing out? A fear of missing out or FOMO is Mm -hmm. a fear of failure. And so you're like, oh, I'm going to miss out on these sales. The reality is like you just said at the very beginning, if you're spending more of your time with the people that mean the most to you, you're likely going to get more referrals from them. You're going to get more self-referrals. You're going to do what Michael Port did in his business as he set up public speaking. No marketing or mm-hmm. sales department at all. I was blown right. away. It's all like, referral. Yeah. It's 100%. Some people can't pull that off, um, but he does. And I think the more you go that direction, the actual sales process is so much easier. They yeah. come in ready to be sold. It's a 15 minute conversation. You're done. Right. Yep. Um, not saying that that's the only thing you have to do, but I think it should be top. And, and you can recognize that as a belief system, as a fear. Now, the other thing is you can recognize it. You can see that it's a subconscious block. You can do the mindset um, you know, activities I mentioned, and you can also just take action. You can just yeah. say, by me spending 80, 90% of my time in these areas that I know are the highest, most important areas of, of my business time, you start to train the brain. You've got the psychoanalytical psychologist and you have the behavioral psychologist, two different types of psychology. 
And the psychoanalysts are going to say, no, you, you change behavior by changing your thoughts. And the behaviors say, no, you change your thoughts by changing your behavior. Mm-hmm. Who's right? <laughs> they both are. Yeah. So do them both. So continue doing even though the subconscious is like, no, this is horrible. I shouldn't be doing this. No, keep doing it because you're exactly right. It is a muscle. And over time, that muscle and that memory will just take over and your business will explode because- yeah. You're doing these things that are most important. The um, immediate then, payoff, yeah. of course, is that I'm happier in my day. Yeah, precisely. I didn't value that a lot as an entrepreneur in the early days of my business. I thought it mm. had to be a grind. And mm. then I asked myself, well, if, if I'm giving up security, which I could be getting at a nine to five job working corporate somewhere, what's the benefit that I'm actually getting if it's just yeah. more stress? Like I could eliminate the stress and just go get a paycheck every two weeks. So That's if great. I'm taking on the risk, what am I looking for as a payoff? And uh, at least short term, I know I'm happier in my work when I'm doing those things that I love doing first. Shauna, I'm sold. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. (laughs) And and the the reason being is like, you looked at from the other direction of like, well, what are you missing out on? Right. Which is a, which honestly is a great way to help people make decisions and use persuasion and sell is like, well, what am I missing out on? The reality is you're missing out on all the stress and all the grind and all the worry and that's exactly why I got into this business is because of stress. So if that's helping you reduce stress, then guess what? You're going to be more productive anyway. You're yeah. going to love work more and you're going to have better balance because when you come home, you're going to be less stressed for your family, regardless of if, if the business is going up, or down, sideways, in between. Now, I want to address this last um, thing that you talked about of, well, what do you do as you're transitioning? Because I don't mm-hmm. think I addressed that very well. And so um, I would normally ask you another question, but this is kind of segueing right into it. Okay. So I'm going to say, if if you're transitioning, give yourself a period of time. Don't do this tomorrow. Say, okay, here's my ideal. And here's where I'm at currently. Whatever you do, don't shame yourself for being there. You spend a lot of time, energy, you know, you've gotten to where you've gotten because of the military mindset you're in. But if you know you want to get to this place where you're working less and you're, you know, uh, things are ordered differently in your time, then say in 90 days, I'm going to be here. Here's my vision for 90 days out there and start taking step one, then step two, then step three to moving your calendar over there through that period of time. I like 90 days. You know why? I talk about it in the book, times and seasons. A season is typically... 90 days, unless you live in Utah and winter <laughs> is seven months like it was last year. Or in Florida where uh, summer is uh, right? seven or eight months. Yeah. yeah. So don't move to Florida and don't move to Utah, <laughs> please. Uh, no, it, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a true principle. Like uh, whenever the seasons change, I have to change my workout routine. I have to change where I'm working out. I have to change, you know, we're, my kids are back into doing school stuff and we're not traveling as much. Like the mindset shifts. So be okay with the season of change. Covey, you know, was talking about you can create a habit in 30 days. Yes, but keeping it is a totally different story. Because after 31, if you've failed on it, it's you're starting over again. If you can make that season of change 90-day period, it's going to be easier as you transition. Mm-hmm. So give yourself some grace. Give yourself right. a plan of like, here's five or six steps I can take to get there over time. And then just be like, wow, I did that. Now I'm going to hire this person. Great. Now I have time to do more of this. Now I'm going to delete this or I'm going to automate that process. And over that time period, you're going to be able to make it. Make sense? Yeah, that's great, man. And uh, giving oneself grace is, I think, one of the hardest things for high performers, high achievers, type A personalities. Uh, It's something we could all do with more of. Yes. Well, and speaking of which, I want to ask you... um, I'm back into the the host seat again. Yeah. What do you see as the biggest issue for other entrepreneurs to have balanced growth? I mean, you you see them on the front lines in the sales position. You see them in the CEO positions. What do you see your experience with them? Um, you know, as you're talking about high performance, you know, and, and high achievers, what do they struggle with to keep that balance while they're growing? So. Um- I see more often than not, they're, they're, I'm using a military analogy here, they're dodging rounds. 
like Neo in that movie, The Matrix, you know, where the bullets are coming at him and he's having to like bend over backwards, which is something I actually started doing in my keynote. I think you've probably gotten to see, uh, you know, where you get to really have fun with the fact that I'm dealing with threats all day. And a lot of us in, in business, we feed off of that. Like if, if a day goes by and we're not solving problems, we feel like we're getting rusty. And so the hindrance to a lot of growth that I see people go through is they find themselves dealing with the same threats again and again, same dozen threats, let's say. And over the course of 40 years, they only deal with those dozen threats and they just keep reoccurring. They keep cropping up. In the military, we had to understand that a threat didn't just mean like a problem that might hold us back for a couple of months towards a goal. Like if a threat cropped up, it could be life and death. And so we were very fanatical about identifying how do we eliminate that threat either through training or through our resources or through our equipment so that it never cropped up again. So we'd have a higher mission success rate, bring more people home. So in business, I, I see a lot of CEOs and I see a lot of salespeople, they find themselves putting out fires all day, day after day. And they never ask the question, how do we take away the matchbook from the person or the thing that's setting the fire? So the, the solution for this is not having to reinvent the wheel. So I, I teach salespeople to be fanatical as well about identifying where a threat crops up. Have I identified that before? Have I dealt with it before? And am I likely going to face it again? If the answer to any of those questions is yes, then we create something that allows us to mitigate the threat if it's going to occur again or to stop the threat. If we can earlier on in the sales cycle or in the sales process or in the sales conversation so that it's never an issue, it just doesn't come up anymore. And you can do this with objections. You can do it with uh, any you know challenge you might hit in the sales cycle. The best salespeople that I see, the ones that just are really, really good at doing this over the course of 20 or 30 years, you watch them flow through a sales conversation. It's like watching a magician at work. They know where every bend in the road is going to be ahead of time. They adapt to it. They already know it's there. They just fly right through it. They're like, I didn't even hear you get hit with one objection. Yeah, because I've heard them all 10,000 times. Well, a lot of us in sales don't have the years to go through 10,000 lost sales to get that good. So it's developing those things that we can put into place now so we don't have to reinvent the wheel, so that we don't have to deal with the same 12 challenges again and again and again. And the, the benefit of this, and this really ties back into your work, is that it allows us to be more present because I'm not having to think on my feet as much as I did before about what am I going to say if this person says this, or if they tell me that, what is the, the line that I need to immediately fire back with them? No, don't worry about having to worry about that in the moment. You've got that outside your head now. You can be more present. You can be more proactive. You can be more service oriented. If you're not having to worry about dancing as fast as you were before, when you had to try and remember all this stuff off the top of your head. Super critical, important actually to balance. Um, you're talking about the finding the root of the problems is you're a business owner. You're on the sales front lines, knowing what is actually going on and finding the root of that problem. Right. So I, I, I love that holistic approach, but I'm also going to say, and I'm also going to say, um, good sales increases balance then. Because if you have a great sales system, I, I'm a firm believer in systems. If you don't have a great sales system and you, you're doing everything else well in the business, I'm just not just saying you personally, but the business doesn't have a great sales cycle uh, or sales system, then you're going to struggle and you will have more fear as we've been talking about that a little bit about that. Because um, even like the Michael Court ports of the world who don't have a sales team <laughs> and they're just referral, they still have a sales system. Oh, it's yeah. called Amy Port. <laughs> yeah. uh, actually, the most... I've hired people underneath them to take on that role now. They have uh, yeah. admissions coordinators, which are essentially those frontline salespeople. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that that's, that's exactly it. So now whether, you know, they're coming to you or you're finding them, um, you know, it's a different, it's a different type of system, but you still need to have a system so that you can have that balance. So I love that because you're mentioning be more present, be more proactive. That's exactly what balanced growth is all about. If you could leave other entrepreneurs with um, a thread of additional advice, something you'd say, hey, this is how you can make your selling more bulletproof. What would be the one, two, three things you would give them at the, at the end of this hour? I'd say define success for yourself in terms that you can control. 
And that means that somebody cutting you a check or agreeing to buy from you doesn't make it to that list because you could do everything right. And this might not be the right buyer at the right time. There may not be that need. So identify what are those objectives that you can control. So that way you can define success for yourself on every call or in every sales meeting. And it might be to leave somebody with something they can immediately implement that you know will help them. It might be to set that next step uh, where they may not be ready now, but you get that next calendar appointment on with them for two weeks, two months, two years hence. Uh, maybe to connect them with someone who could be of service to them. You discover that your line of products and services is really not the right fit for them for a variety of reasons, but you've got just the man, you've got just the woman that could help them out from what they've told you so far. So define what success is for yourself. And that way, at the end of 100 calls where you haven't made a sale, you know that you've made an impact. I'd say that's a, a big thing to do. Um, second thing, don't reinvent the wheel. If you encounter a problem or an objection or a situation where you knew that thing that cropped up held you back from going as far as you needed to go or wanted to go, take the time to capture it outside your head and dig into some research. Ask your peers, ask uh, you know Dr. Perry, ask your folks on LinkedIn, ask your teammates if you have them, what they've done to overcome something like that in the past and begin to use it. Get it outside your head, get it into something you can try differently next time so that you're not hit by that same wall and react the same way. And the third final thing, uh, define success for yourself holistically. And I know you talk about this a lot, Travis, uh, but figure out at the end of your career, what does winning look like? Not just professionally, but personally. And take the time to put those steps into place today. This is something I see a lot of entrepreneurs wait 20 or 30 years too late to really consider. And you have to backtrack a lot. You got to repair a lot of relationships if you're only focused on professional success. And you realize when it's time to retire that you're estranged from your spouse, your kids don't want to talk to you. You've got the beautiful house in West Palm Beach, but that's about all you got. And I don't want you to find yourself there. So define success holistically and understand that you may not be at the top 1% of your industry. So you may not be the most successful of whatever it is that you do. Uh, but being a successful human being, that's completely within your control. And those are things that you can take steps on today. Um, so I say all of those things because I've had to learn some of them the hard way. <laughs> those are things you could begin doing. I love it. No, it's totally aligned with our whole balance message of, of uh, knowing what your mission is in every area of life and here on earth in this time that we have because uh, it's 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 uh definitely has an end in the beginning and uh you, you know we're looking back on it later in life you will be asking yourselves what what was i successful in at life period end of story life. so i yeah. i love that i think that's mic drop moment that is <laughs> that's the gold nugget from today is what does winning look like holistically uh to you and what what are you doing uh, to to make the action, the inroads, the steps towards achieving that. Thank you for being here, Sean. Thank you for giving of your time. Uh, and as you notice, Sean is is a man of his word, and he's he's just one of the the best guys in sales that I know. I mean, who comes on to talk about sales and turns around and asks me for advice? Um, it basically is giving you know us a look into how he operates. That he cares so much about you as his client as a potential client um this is a quality that quite honestly is rare in in salesmanship there mm -hmm. should be such a thing uh and so i i really love that uh, that you're here and you're helping the industry uh you know anyone involved in sales as the industry that i'm talking about you don't have to be a financial a financial professional or planner or mortgage broker it doesn't matter whatever you're doing even a parent we're selling. We are persuading our children to go to bed on time. We are teaching them principles and hopefully helping to shape their behavior for good. So I, I do appreciate your time today, buddy. Thank you for being on the Balanced Growth Show. My pleasure, sir. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. If you've enjoyed this as much as I have, like, share, subscribe, rate this highly on whatever you find yourself listening on this podcast. And somebody who needs today. If uh, people want to get in touch with you, Sean, by the way, how do they reach out to you? Where do they find you, my friend? Bulletproofselling.us. Uh, I grabbed the US domain because I love helping American-based companies succeed on the battlefield of business. That's my passion. So mm -hmm. tons of resources on that website and lots of ways to get in contact with me directly. 
Awesome. We'll have that in the show notes. Until next time, everyone, and thank you for listening. Remember, live life on purpose. Mm -hmm.